really? <laughs> the big firms like Bernard Madoff Investment Securities or Merrill Lynch, Chase, JP Morgan, you don't have to worry about them. They're big, a trillion dollars. Bernard Madoff is trading more than JP Morgan, more Merrill Lynch back in the early 2000s. Trading volume was higher, not lower. <clears throat> okay. Bernard Madoff did circumvent the securities regulations. He faked the execution of millions of security trades. We only have a couple more videos, but they're very instructive. Let's see what happens here. <laughs> Street legend Bernard Madoff has clients panic that their wealth may be gone. It's hard to believe that somebody so successful, who people trusted for years, was so greedy and so corrupt to steal their money. It's it's remarkable. People who I've spoken to are shocked that Bernie Madoff, a trusted guy, would steal their money. Madoff, former chairman of the Nasdaq stock market, built one of the most successful trading firms on Wall Street. It was in a separate, more secretive investment division located on a different floor in this office tower that he allegedly perpetrated the fraud. According to civil and criminal complaints, Madoff confessed he had been cheating investors for years, and he estimated his total losses from the fraud may have been $50 billion. According to the criminal complaint, on Wednesday, here at his Manhattan apartment, Bernie Madoff confessed to his two sons, Andrew and Mark, both senior executives of the company. The father said of his investment firm, quote, it's just a big lie. It was basically a giant Ponzi scheme. Madoff allegedly had been using new investment money from clients to pay supposed profits out to other investors. Under the weight of a tumbling stock market, the scheme had collapsed. One of Madoff's attorneys said, Bernie Madoff is a long-standing leader in the financial services industry. He will fight to get through this unfortunate set of events. <laughs> Madoff is out on $10 million bond. He's facing a single charge of securities fraud, which carries a maximum prison sentence of 20 years. For CNNMoney.com, I'm Alan Chernoff. <clears throat> and you better remember when it, uh, when it occurred, December 11th, 2008. And they pulled some numbers that turned out to be wrong. And one important point to think about his attorney there. His attorney was David Horowitz. And David Horowitz was the attorney uh, that represented one of the firms involved in one of the first SEC investigations. So David Horowitz has been around for 20 plus years uh, representing Bernard Madoff. And of course, he didn't know anything either. Sure. Um, <laughs> It continued for at least three decades. We still don't know how long the fraud went on. It could be as early as 1965. Um, in a lot of Ponzi schemes, all the investors are kind of treated equal. Everybody gets about the same deals. Maybe those later on get a little better deals because you're scrounging around for money. We're going to talk about the differences in investors at some point, too, because Bernard Madoff did not treat every investor the same. He had a select few. Pay attention to the name of Madoff's attorney. You're going to see him again later in this course. He's an important character because his name keeps cropping up, protecting Madoff from SEC investigations and from other allegations of fraud. The Lipstick <coughs> Building, you saw a picture of it there at the end. Uh, Madoff firm had three floors on there, the 17th, 18th, and 19th floor. The 19th floor was a legitimate part of the business. That's where they executed real trades for real companies, trading real stocks with real money. On the 17th floor is where the investment advisory accounts were done. And that floor had limited access. It was key access to a select queue. And somewhere about 20 people had access to that. And who had access is another really important part of this. The Suns worked only on the 19th floor, which was made on sole attempt to protect them from this whole thing. There's a reason why it's not going to work so well. But he did attempt to protect them. <clears throat> OK. This thing went on for a long time. Even Bernie couldn't believe he got away with it. There was an investigation done on May 19th of 2006. And <clears throat> the Office of Investigations for the SEC wrote the report on August 31st titled Investigation of Failure of the SEC to Uncover Bernard Madoff's Ponzi Scheme. This is a 500-page report that was done in 2009. But they're talking about what happened during this investigation. Okay, and here's the comments that are relevant. 
during a recent interview with the OIG, this is during this investigation, Madoff stated that he thought he was caught. And he thought he was caught for a reason. Every broker dealer trades stock through something called the DTC. And that was this thing. Oh, it does. God, how do you like that? <laughs> okay. And they all said, it was amazing to me that I didn't get caught because what the investigator said, said to him is, are the securities of the DTC, when you trade securities, it goes to the central clearinghouse, and they keep a record of who is on both sides of the transactions. So, Bernard Madoff had an account, and his account number was 646, and the investigator asked him for his account number. Bernard Madoff had produced all these statements. If the investigator had taken any one of those statements <coughs> and placed a call to the DTC and said, could you take a look at May 12, 2006, and tell me how many shares of IBM were traded for account number 646, he would have found that the answer is zero. And it's over. That's it right there. Because when they finally did make these calls, and they made the call, by the way, on December 12th of 2008, and they asked about how many trades were made, and the call took, from what I understand, six minutes. There was no trading in account 646. For years, there was no trading. That one phone call, it doesn't require the Pink Panther to understand that a single phone call to say, can you tell me if there were trades done in this account, would have ended the entire thing. And it would have ended it in 1992, which was the first investigation. The call was never made. Madoff stated it was obvious they thought that something was amiss. <coughs> he went on to say that when they asked for the DTC account number, quote, I thought it was the end game. Over Monday morning, they called DTC and this will all be over, but it never happened. After all this, I got away lucky. But he said it was just a matter of time, saying this was the nightmare I lived with. When enforcement did not follow up the DTC, Madoff said, I was absolutely astonished to the investigator. We're not talking about mathematicians going through complex formulas to understand what this guy was doing. We're talking about a phone call that says, can you tell me if account number 646 has actually done any trading? Five minutes, and it ends. Um, Mr. Chung, who was an SEC investigator back in May, said, had the enforcement staff obtained DTC records from Madoff's account after his testimony, the enforcement staff most likely would have discovered his Ponzi suit. Well, a little follow-up on this, because I found out what happened and why they didn't ask for the records. And the reason they didn't ask for it is they said it would have simply taken too much time to actually look at the records. And we figured he's the chairman of the NASDAQ. He wouldn't do something like that. So it would have taken too much time. What are we paying these guys for? What are we paying the SEC investigators an average of $180,000 a year for when they can't conduct a single competent investigation? And this doesn't require competence. First phone call to check the records. Made us in prison for the rest of his life, but has anyone else paid anything? Well, Bernard made out pretty guilty. And actually, this is really bad for his investors when he pleaded guilty. Because if he doesn't, and he fights this, we get this thing called discovery. And under discovery, we can collect all these records from all the people that we think are involved under subpoenas. And by pleading guilty, all of that goes away. And we've talked to the U.S. Attorney's Office repeatedly about this, as to why you can't go and subpoena these records from people like Andrew Madoff or Peter Madoff and find out how much money is going to these accounts. And the reason was because Madoff pleaded guilty, and you can't do it. <clears throat> He's serving 150 years in prison, okay. in a really nice prison yeah. down in North Carolina. I don't know if you guys saw the date on CNBC for American Greed, but Bernie's schedule looks something like this. You get up at 6 a.m. and um, he's due at the um, he's due at the cafeteria at 6:30, and he spends one hour working in the cafeteria serving food. Then he has breakfast. And after breakfast, he pretty much goes out to the prison yard, and he plays bocce ball and some other odds and ends. And he's got to be back at the cafeteria at 12, and he serves one hour. Then he has lunch, and typically goes to the prison library, and sits around and chats and things like that. At 5 o'clock, he has to be back at the uh, cafeteria, and he serves one hour. 
and uh, then he has dinner himself, and by 7, 7.30, he's normally watching movies with the rest of the prisoners, and bedtime, lights out is 10. Three hours of that. I have a question. Yeah. You, you mentioned different agencies. Take, for example, the SEC. To what extent is this government, and to what extent is it private? I mean, is SEC, it really a government agency? SEC is all government. And we're going to go through federal employees. <coughs> all federal employees, all people being paid by you. That's right. And I'm going through every one of the agencies. There's a lot of them. And, and, and uh, who, who, who heads up the SEC? How is he appointed by whom? Uh, the one who has it right now is Mary Shapiro. Mary Shapiro is appointed by a federal um, uh, a legislative group. The Senate uh, Banking Committee appoints her. And I think the guy's name was David Cox, who was running it before this. And yeah. we'll go through that again in detail, but every one of them is a federal employee. And you might have seen, somewhere in 2009, there was a report about how federal employees at the SEC spend their time. And uh, it turned out that they were watching porn many hours at the senior level on their computers. So what's happened to these employees? They've been fired, they lose their pension, what happened? <laughs> Not one person from the SEC ever lost their job over this. Not one person from the SEC was ever censured. Mm -hmm. Virtually every one of the employees that actually worked on the six investigations got letters of commendation in their employee jackets. Mm -hmm. Virtually, and I'll go through this because this just happened, most of the senior level SEC employees that worked on the investigations of Bernard Nadal now work in private industry with an average salary of $2 million. And they were making about $180,000 by working for the SEC. Virtually all of the people involved in the SEC investigations were attorneys. Virtually all with no prior industry experience. You come out of the schools, you go to the SEC, you learn how the process works, and you go to private industry and make big dollars. You do not want to antagonize private industry because that's where your next job is. By not having industry experience, that allows the people who are the wolves out there who do work in private industry to hoodwink the employees on a regular basis. They are much better trained, much better educated in industry standards, and much better able to hide things from the investigators. The investigators are either incompetent or negligent, and probably a combination of both. Most SEC employees don't stay with the SEC. They leave and go to private industry because that's where the money is. How do you solve that kind of problem? You pay them better, for one thing. And uh, there's a guy by the name of Harry Markopoulos, who was the big uh, whistleblower here. We'll talk about him later. He recommends firing all the attorneys and bringing in people with industry experience to run the investigations because they know where the skeletons are. The attorneys don't. When you see what the SEC did with these early investigations, you're going to be astonished at, at what they missed. And you'll be astonished at the backbiting that goes on between the Boston office of the SEC and the New York office. Harry Markopoulos, the whistleblower, was in Boston. He reported all this information to Boston, and Boston said, we can't do the investigation because Bernard Madoff is in New York. But we have big battles with the people in New York, and they won't listen to us. Yeah. Uh, Gordon Gecko's quote, greed is good. If you were to incentivize the SEC persons to get a taste of their discoveries, that is, if they turn over a billion dollar Ponzi scheme, they personally get a big taste of that windfall. That is, you know, they, they get the loot that this guy has in his pocket. But that's their job. And, you know, just simply put blood in the water as opposed to a government suit, you know, having their, their uh, pension or their, you know, GS-19 pension uh, salary. The question is, there's no incentive for the SEC, like there is an incentive for these characters on Wall Street, to do this stuff. That's part of the whistleblower legislation. Yes. And we'll cover that again in a later course. But whistleblower legislation, for instance, Harry Markopoulos, who, who kind of reported this to the SEC, didn't get five cents yeah. because of the way they wrote the legislation. So even SEC, SEC employees are not compensated. But whistleblowers outside of the SEC really aren't compensated either when there's a Ponzi scheme involved. I kind of agree with you. You either have to pay them better 
Or if you do a poor job, you get fired. 